So what was Netflix when you joined in 99? So what was Netflix like at that? Like, what was oh, the company? At well, that for point? me, it was like Mars. Because, right? uh, yeah. you know, I, I, my very first e-commerce transaction was buying that airline ticket to go meet Reed in, in 1999. Right. Yeah. yeah, right. And um, when I got up there, I would go into this little, it was basically in a strip center, an industrial center. And I go into this office, and there's um, people buzzing around. I wasn't sure what they were all doing. But there were piles and piles of boxes in the, in the receiving, you know, in the lobby. And I'm like, look at all the names of a lot of companies I never heard of, drugstore.com and all these the, the names that are also like now blacksmithery. Uh, but I look at these things and I say, wow, everyone here like really lives online already. Right. And they get all of their things. I mean, there are people who are getting razor blades online. That just was to me, that was such a foreign thing. Right. But, um, but it was, uh, and everybody at Netflix back in those days had a scale on their desk because everyone was trying to optimize for postal weight. I mean, so. Right. Um, it was a very cool, it was a very different culture. Because the business was mailing DVDs. Mailing DVDs, that's all mailing we did DVDs, yeah, right? it was yeah. Domestic only, DVD by mail. Yeah. And, uh, and then I had this great meeting with Reed where he basically went on to describe Netflix almost exactly like it is right now. Is right? Yeah. He, all, as, a phys, as a digital company, yeah. uh, we talked a lot about downloading instead of streaming because streaming really didn't exist at the right. time, right. conceptually even. Right. But he was very clear-headed that all entertainment would come into the home on the internet very soon. Right. And that was, and I told at the time that we met, and he, we, and he was telling me about was my introduction to Moore's Law and all these different things. Like, I, to me, that sounded insane. Because right. someone had just emailed me a clip from South Park that took seven days to open. Right. I said, <laughs> so there's no way that uh, this is right. going to displace right. no, it was, television. It's was, it was hard to even describe. It, was, it would have been an absurd idea. Completely. Like completely. just anybody who tried to do video on the internet yeah. would have just known, obviously, this can't but, work. But right. Reed talked about it to me that day like, right. this, like he was telling me the sky is blue. Right. And I, it just it stuck with me because I, it, what occurred to me was I bet nobody ever changed the world without telling someone they were going to do it first. And I bet it sounded crazy. Yeah, that's right. And, and I wanted to, to be on that train. Yeah. And it took me a few months but because I, I, I was just involved in this company that was a disaster. And we were renegotiating all of our deals. And I had just fired a whole team of people. And so uh, Reed was, kept offering me to come on to Netflix. And I, um, he happened to call one night when I was in Philadelphia where we had a big headquarters and it was a miserable night and I was in a lousy hotel and he calls and says, I mean, before I give up on this, why are you not joining this company? I mean, we're, we're really going to do things here. And I said, uh, look it, I'm just, I'm just really busy. I've got all this stuff going on. And I went on to detail all the problems in this two very almost bankrupt companies coming together to form one giant bad company. And, uh, and he said, uh, um, he goes, well, it sounds like they need you. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's, it. that's why I'm here. And he goes, well, they need you in India feeding starving children. Why aren't you doing that? And I just, I love that clarity. I just fell in love with it. So to me, I just said, then on the phone, I said, I'm coming. Wow. So that was, uh, that was my introduction. DVD by mail was a big success. And then obviously the, the decision to cut over to streaming <clears throat> at a certain point was, was a big yeah. success. And then there was, right, the really big decision, as it turns out, which is the decision to go into original content, yeah. right? Because the, the business model for DVDs, right, had been buy other people's content, yeah. previously produced content. The original business model for streaming was to buy other people's content. Right. And then at some point, you guys started to fund and create your own content. Yeah, what I, was that decision? What was that conversation like? So I, I find the, the big fundamental difference between Silicon Valley and, and Hollywood, I think, is the quant, quant and qual. Right? I think that there's a, um, the, the inability for Hollywood to wrap their head around you know, around quant and... So quant it, numbers, yeah. what's qual, yeah. gut, gut or instinct or feeling yeah. or... That, or the, whole, the whole efficiency driven thing is right. very Silicon Valley. Okay. And the whole quality driven thing is very Hollywood. Right. And rarely do those things meet. Mm -hmm. And if you, and I think why Netflix has been successful in content, to your point that it's pretty rare, um, is that we, ne we, we always have kept a presence in Hollywood and a presence in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. We never, the people who work for me in, in LA, there's about a thousand people who work in LA that, uh, on all the aspects of content. Um, they all think they work at the greatest entertainment company in the world. Yeah. And I hope they, I think they're right. Yeah. And I think there's about 4,000 people in Silicon Valley who think they work for the best tech company tech in the company. world. And I think they're right. Yeah. And, and we never try to jam either culture on the other. Yeah. We just, we really do respect the two, the two cultures. Um, it's not that they're um, uh, inseparable, you know, not that we're, we're going to just erase all the, the challenges between the two cultures, because they are different. They are really different. It's just tribal, though. And it's just that, you know, we, at, the begin, at the early days of entertainment on the internet, the tech companies would come into Hollywood with, they'd, they'd lawyer up and agent up and have these meetings and write big checks and just fly home. 
and nobody knew who they were. And the entertainment industry is almost all about relationships and trust because it's also because it, again, there's no, there is no quant. So you really have to trust your instincts on a lot of things, including people. So the reason I could get revenue share deals done in our kind of really crippled business back in those early days was because I knew all those guys. All those guys who were running the home video businesses um, used to tr sell me movies out of a book in a video store. Right. And they kind of grew and we all kind of came up at the same time. Right. But there was no reason on paper to approve those deals right. or to give us these big lines of credit to ship us DVDs and all those things. Right. So it was really just that relationship thing that um, it turns out to be very, very valuable. A lot of Silicon Valley companies, if, if, they, if they heard this, uh, would just say flat out, like, it, it, that can't work, or it certainly would not work for us, uh, yeah. another company. And the reason is because, like, consistency of culture is viewed as so important in the Valley. And, right, the, and, and the reason for that, right, is if you, it's so hard to get, just do one thing yeah. well, to try to do two things well in two different cultures, like, you typically end up with basically civil yeah. war inside a company. How does, how does this not, like, how does, has, this, has this gotten close? To, uh, how high have the tensions risen? Or how have you been able to keep the culture separate and yet not have that kind of split or divide happen inside it's, the company? It's, it's, it's really, I mean, it's all credit to Reed. I think it's Reed had created a culture where you're free to ask questions, you're free to push back, but support the outcome. Mm -hmm. So everyone has got a, you know, a strong voice at the table, but once the decision is made, everyone supports the outcome. Right. And so I think it's that, 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 that candor and trust thing that happens uh, enables people to say, I, I don't really know what you're doing, right. but you do, and I trust that you do, and you're gonna run as hard as you can, I'm gonna support you. Even though you're not in the same city, even though I don't yeah. see you very often, yeah. still, we yeah. still feel like we have a bond. That and we do have this great kind of thing where, where, where um, Reed comes down south, and I go up north, and we go back and forth. We have right. this thing called New Employee College, so when it, and it, we do it uh, four times a year, so when people join, they all sit through a day of, you know, of lectures from all the heads of all the departments who really ground everybody in the vision and ground each other in the culture and what we up to. And so everyone really kind of intimately knows what each other d does, but there's no expectation that we're supposed to be able to do both things. Right. So um, in that way, I think people really feel like what, the, what everyone's doing at Netflix is solving a big, hairy problem, and all tech companies want to do that. Right. And that's included our people in LA, and the big, hairy problem is making great content and finding people who want to see it and putting them together. Right. And so we, we're all part of the same, you know, debugging of the hairy problem. Right. So how many pitches or proposals or out, say opportunities do you think you have, or does your organization have a year for content that you could buy or make? Um, I guess there's probably seven to t 10 a d uh, pitches a day. Mm -hmm. They come in every single day. Seven to ten pitches a day times yeah, 200. Yeah, and, and it might be even days, 20. So there's days that are 20. 2,000. So we're maybe 2,000 pitches a year, which yeah. is actually, actually very similar to, yeah, to, to right. Venture Capital. So that's about right. 2,000 pitches a year. And how many, how many times, how many do you say yes? Uh, well, we'll have, um, this year we'll have 30 uh, original series, 80 original films, mm -hmm. 35 original kid series, mm -hmm. um, 19 local language original series being produced all over the world. Uh, 65 documentary projects. Right. So um, I, I would say it's about one in a hundred. Is that right? Yeah. Right. Okay. And it, is, it turns out there's like hardly any, there's no shortage of ideas. Right. Uh, but there is a shortage of people's, uh, people with the ability to execute on a big vision. Right. Right. And so you have to kind of really buy into the story, you have to buy into the, the creator, you have to buy into their ability to bring that to screen. And it's that, that's the magic combination you're trying to look for in these things. Right. So in venture, is, is, there's, there's actually a lot of similarities to venture capital as you're describing it, right? Which is, it's actually about 2,000 a year. We fund, we fund you know, maybe 20 to 30 is sort of what the, what the, what the, yeah. what the top firms tend to do. So maybe even a, a slightly ho lower uh, uh, rate of green lights. But um, as I say, we, we always worry about sort of two, two categories of mistakes, sort of, you know, sort of false negatives and false positives. And sort of yeah. uh, false, um, uh, false positives, we say yes to something that fails, right? False negative is we say no to something that succeeds, yeah. right? And at, at least in our business, I can tell you, those are the ones that like torture the shit out of you. Yeah, like, we get a couple. The rest of your life. Yeah. Um, and, and, by, and it's not just, it's, it's an emotional thing, but it's also, a, it's actually actually a financial thing, right? Was there something you, yeah. you, something you fail to find that then goes on to become some giant hit? Can I ask you a question? How, how often, I turn the table thing. So how, when, when that happens to you, yeah. is, it, is it basically, can you look at it and say, um, well, that's exactly the thing that they pitched, and that's exactly how they executed it, and that's the exact team that did it. No, 
No, yeah. so that's maybe so maybe that's the, the, yeah maybe that's the maybe that's the escape hatch uh, for yeah. that. For maybe the bad, that's how I rationalized too for yeah. the bad decisions exactly. Which is yeah, yeah. no, I mean well and I, w- I guess I would say almost all the successes change a lot as well as uh, almost all the ones that we pick to succeed fa- change a lot as well as all the ones that we don't pick that succeed. Yeah, they also tend to change a yeah. lot, and so and a lot of that is right the ducking yeah. and weaving that happens as a and that's part of why you're looking to back a team right is because like if if if, yeah. if it was a foregone conclusion if all the work had already been done. Right? Yeah. They, they wouldn't need. They wouldn't need you. Like they just. They, they'd, exactly. already be, they'd already be, be off and running. And so, by definition, you're backing somebody who's making yeah. kind of promises in a lot of cases ahead of the, actual knowledge. The, the, is the, that the Duffer Brothers with Stranger Things is probably the best example of yeah. um, two very young guys who've never really done it, yeah. but they had an amazing vision. Yeah. Um, I knew as soon as we heard the Stranger Things pitch that we were doing this show, yeah. and I knew at every step of the way as the epi- as the scripts were coming in, as the episodes were coming in, yeah. that it was something special. Not at the scale that it is. Yeah. I, I didn't foresee that it'd be as big a hit as it is. Yeah. Um, but what was interesting is, is that these guys, basically we got down to the execution question, can they do it? Right. And that's all they'd really done is a couple of episodes of a show called Wayward Pines. It was a good show, right. but it wasn't their show and it was a, you know, basically they executed someone else's vision, but this is their vision. It was very, and it was an unbelievably crystal clear vision for that show. Right. And they had made a small movie for Warner Brothers that had never been released. And they basically said, well, you should take a look at this movie. And we tracked down Warner and asked them if they'd screen it for us. And it was a little tiny zombie movie that uh, was really fantastic. And mostly what it said was, wow, that's it. On, almost no ben- on almost no resources, they pulled together this really rich, satisfying movie experience, right. and which gave us confidence that they could do it on the small screen too. Right, right. But, so when do you know, maybe Stranger Things was a case where you knew early, but like when do you know, at what point do you believe that you know with like 80% certainty that a project is going to work, like that it will be successful as a, as a, as a creative and a commercial uh, 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 project? Well, on the commercial side, sometimes you really don't know until it hits, because there are some times that, um, that I'm actually really surprised that um, it, something doesn't take off immediately. Like, why is, it not, why is everyone not in love with this? Uh, as much as I am, you know, so, and then the, but then over time people, catch on, it becomes like a word of mouth phenomenon that takes off. Um, Making a Murder is one of those that, you know, we released it on December 18th last year. It turned out to be like the perfect show at the perfect time because people were home. Right. And so when they started watching it and got so hooked on it and started tweeting about it and re- posting on Facebook about it, people were the, are available to watch it. Yeah. And this collective word of mouth around the world just exploded. We, didn't, we spent almost no marketing money on the show at all. Right. And it just exploded on its own. Right. So nobody could, and nobody inside of Netflix foresaw that was going to be, right. you know, an overnight sensation like that, like it was. Right. Um, but so a lot of times it isn't until that, you know, till you get out, till it actually gets out there. To are you certain, certain? Right. But I think when you start getting the early cuts of the show, and you realize that that great script did, you know, shows up on screen, yeah. that that we're and we're in good shape as long as we put enough of a, the work into the script. So there, there's a lot of kind of modern cultural critique, and the internet has kind of caused people to get you know, very concerned about this. Um, there's sort of a modern critique, which is basically like, let's just say, in the past, culture was highly fragmented. There were lots of variability among cultures, lots of different languages, cultures, even dialects, uh, right among languages. There were lots of different niches, you know, and the yeah. people in different countries or different regions would have, you know, wildly, even here in the US, like wildly different accents, wildly different food preferences, wildly different yeah. entertainment preferences. And the, the, the normal critique basically goes that the culture, both in the U.S. and globally, is homogenizing, right, because of information, communication technology, information technology, started with probably t- radio and television, and now with the internet. Right. And basically, right, languages are vanishing, dialects are vanishing, everybody's seeing this, you know, big budget American entertainment, you know, it's a, you know everybody's seeing superhero movies, everybody's listening to the same pop music, like, it's, it's, there's this kind of mass homogenization kind of washing out of yeah. cultural variability. And then, but then uh, you hear the Netflix story and you hear the, the opposite, which is this sort of increased level of sort of fragmentation specialization. What's, what's your view? Like, where is this all, where, where is culture headed in that sense? We're actually straddling both sides of it because a show like Stranger Things is completely global. Mm-hmm. Proportionate to our subscriber base, people watch Stranger Things all over the world. Which is a little surprising because in a sense, like, I'm, I'm like, like, you may, like, there's, like, if, if you're my age, like, you're the exact, like, you grew up in the Midwest in the 1980s, like, it, it feels like it ta- is literally R- tailor-made. Written for you. Yeah. Right, for, li- like, literally yeah. straight for me. And, yeah. and so I, I could easily imagine somebody in another country and maybe a different age saying, like, what the hell are these kids doing? But <laughs> you know that's what's not new? the case. What's new is that there, nothing is retro anymore, really. Because, okay. like, my kids are 21 and 23. They knew all those movie references is that right? because yeah. those movies never go away anymore because right. of Netflix. So they saw Ghostbusters. They saw them. They saw, right, they saw right, them. Right. So they knew exactly what those kids were talking about. Right, right. Now they didn't know all the you know the the lifestyle things that yeah. you and I knew about yeah. you know about that time. Yeah. But they definitely knew those movie references and it made totally made sense to them. Yeah. But what it, the, what I mean we're probably doing both sides of it is 
Um, we're making local language original shows now in 19 countries. And, they, and those shows, the mandate of those shows is, is that they're incredibly authentically local. Right. So the uh, Sabora, the Italian show that we just did, it's all shot in Rome, all Italian cast, all in Italian. And the real art that we're trying to recreate is this, you know, when you think about dubbing into English, you think about Godzilla and karate movies and very bad lip syncing and all those things. So that really never really can, could never get very mainstream. So right now, we're, one of the things we're working on is these local language originals, uh, very artfully dubbing them into English for, for our US audience to enjoy too. And you show a show like The 3%, which is a show we make in Brazil, in all in Portuguese with an all Brazilian cast. And the watching on Netflix in the US would be equivalent to a pretty good sized cable hit. I mean, people like to watch the show. They watch it subtitled, they watch it dubbed. Um, partly, I'm sure they're not watching it in native Portuguese and without the subtitles much. Because right. um, I don't think any television has ever traveled out of Brazil, really, but maybe a novella or two. So, so what we're trying to do is tell these stories that are authentically local. And the, and the win for us is that they actually travel more the more authentic they are. Because mm -hmm. there's something inorganic about the English language European television show right. that forces it, that causes it not to become very mainstream or beloved. So it's liked. Those shows get liked, but they never get loved. Right. Right. So we really are, we are trying to push these shows to be as authentically local as possible, embedding that that's what will make them travel. And then we'll use technology to overcome the hurdles like language. Let's talk about creative control. So there's, I, I, was, I like to think a lot, you've referenced this before, kind of the similarities, differences of the sort of entertainment model of, of sort of backing these projects and the Silicon Valley model. And there's actually a lot of similarities in how we, you know, how you, yeah. you and I kind of, from very different, you know, sort of perspectives think about, I think things like risk and reward and portfolios and so forth. Let's talk about creative control. And so my sort of sense of the sort of standard Hollywood model in the last 20 years has been that movies are kind of what you might describe in the Valley as like a synthetic, say a professionally constructed startup, right? Which is to say, you know, we're basically, we have this idea, we have somebody to fund it, and then we're basically going to go hire a CEO, right? We're, you know, we're going to go hire a head of marketing, we're going to hire a head of engineering, right. and try to kind of put it together, and everybody's going to kind of fight and argue. And at the end of the day, you know, the guy, the guy with the money is probably going to make a lot of the decisions about what happens in the company. Um, and then uh, on the other hand, it seems like TV is more like the sort of, which you might describe as like an organic Silicon Valley startup, which is like, as, as you said, sort of a founder with a vision, yeah. right? And then ide ideally, right, an idealized model, a founder who, is a C who then becomes a CEO of the vision or a founder yeah. who goes out and finds a partner, right, a CEO right. or a president to be able to partner with, to be able to develop the vision. Um, TV is more like that, is, is, my, is my sense, because with, with TV, right, there's this concept of, of the showrunner, right, that's emerged, which basically closer is... Closer to a CEO. A showrunner is closer to a CEO than showrunner's closer. the director. And, and, yeah. the sh and significantly with TV, right, the showrunner is the writer. Yeah. Right, the, the, the writers are actually put in... Like, right. most movies are not directed by the writer, whereas yeah. many, many TV shows, including a lot of the ones that you yeah, do, they are, are... TV, they often refer to as a writer-driven medium, but... Yeah. Because of that. Right. And so, so TV is closer to the Silicon Valley model, so sort of founder-driven, writer-driven, yeah. like the, the creative it's more force. collaborative, too, in that way. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so I, I, guess, so I guess the question, and then I know there's this sort of tension, so especially with the TV, TV shows, like I talked to a lot of people, you know, friends of mine who run you know, TV networks, and they say it's like, well, it's like great. It's like the good news is these writers have huge vision. They're not always the most practical people in the world. They're not always the most commercial people in the world. Like, we really need to give them a lot of feedback, you know, yeah. and for the founders in the audience, you might have experienced this from your VCs uh, in tech, you know, we might have to give you a lot of, they, in Hollywood, they call them notes because yeah. they come so frequently. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, feedback uh, on what you should do. Um, uh, Netflix, I think you, you had an established an early reputation as providing an uh, unusual level uh, of creative control yeah. to the showrunner, to the writer, to yeah. the showrunner. Is that, is that true? Yeah, definitely. And it actually started out quite practical. I, I didn't have any staff. Okay. So uh, <laughs> we, had to, we were trying to run fast and try to make good things. And I realized along the way that the one thing that the, nef the Netflix culture could bring to entertainment was that kind of freedom and responsibility that's helped us become so successful, mm -hmm. which was our job is really picking great people mm -hmm. and giving them the resources to do the best work of their life, right. which requires getting out of their way right. and letting them make decisions and live and die by them. Right. So we had this, uh, David, F House of Cards was our first original show on Netflix. And um, the deal we made with David Fincher was, I'm gonna give you two seasons of the show no pilot and no maybe notes. Just say, David Fincher Done. is like, I don't know, maybe, the, I don't know, like the Steve Jobs or something. He's I think like, he's the greatest director of our generation, for yeah, sure. The greatest, fil the greatest film director. Like, I mean, if you've seen movies, Seven and, I mean, Seven, many, many just Fight absolutely. Club, and, right, yeah, right. Fight Benjamin Club, yeah. Button. Yeah, um, and so like, th this is like dealing with a super high-end top yeah, professional, right? Yeah, and my deal, so basically the deal was, he, he could have, it could have been, uh, he could give me 26 hours of home movies 
Um, with this, but, but I said, but you have to put your name on it. Mm -hmm. right. So the key was is that somebody who was great, incredibly gifted, but, and cared about his brand. Right. And then, get, then what do you need? Right. And then try to, then we ran forward. Right. And he basically was super collaborative on the things that he wanted to collaborate on. He was not on the things that he was crystal clear on. Um, and he was, you know, he has a reputation of being quite difficult. And uh, around, but, it, but what I found is that he's, no, he's just really exacting, which I loved. I mean, he knew exactly what he wanted to do and he knew exactly what it was going to cost. And he fought only for things that mattered. So there was no wasted argument at all. So, but the critique would be right that you just cherry picked. You just cherry picked, like getting a getting chance to work with a person who's like at the top of their field, who yeah. has this amazing track record of accomplishment. Okay. Yeah. And it all lined up perfect because I didn't have anyone to give them notes anyway. Okay. <laughs> that was great. But now do 100 more. Yeah. Um, and there aren't 100 David Finchers out there. And so over time, as you, as you did, by the way, Stranger yeah. Things, but many yeah. other projects, you're kind of laddering down on people with experience and track yeah, record. Definitely. And, maybe, like, and let's just even say operational skill. I mean, the, and the, I mean, obviously, the execution experience between the Duffer brothers and David Fisher couldn't be any further apart. Right. Uh, but, but in fact, you know, they, they turned out to be really great. So I guess do. my question is, what, at what point do you jerk the leash? Like, at what point do you assert control and say, like, look, like, this is not, like, this is going, like, way too long. This is way over budget. This is the, not good. This actor is actors miscast. Yeah, this plot the, point makes no sense. The great thing is they know, too. What's that, sorry? They, they know, too. Okay. They, so they're not okay. surprised when things are not going as planned. Okay. Um, I used to think when you read about uh, changing a showrunner on a show that was a massive failure, oh my God, who, what broke that this had to happen? And it's actually kind of an organic process. And, when, and it's part of the process of making great television. And how do they know? Is recognizing like, ultimately yeah. that this isn't going the way that they thought or well, where they envisioned it. So it's one thing for you to know in the sense of you have some level of objective remove and maybe you get to look at the data and so forth. But I mean, as you know, when people work on a project together, it's very easy to get emotionally wrapped up in it and it's very easy to kind of not get the feedback. So when you say they know, like how do they know? How, how do they come to that awareness? You, well, I, think, I don't think it's any different than um, when you let somebody go in the office. They, they also know it's, and they're quite relieved sometimes, you know, when it's cut because they, they've known it for, they knew it before you, okay. that things weren't going well. Okay. Um, and this is, you have a day-to-day -day process, and if you're not shooting X number of pages a day, you know things are not, you know, going off, you're going to go over budget. Right. Um, and if the performances aren't working, everyone sees it at the same time. Okay. And it's just really kind of, does everybody come to the same conclusion at roughly the same time? Okay. That makes it a better experience and a better creative experience for everybody. Right. And it's kind of like, it does supporting this vision right. at the expense of every other part of the, this part of the vision at the expense of the whole vision, right. is that a good thing to do or not? Right. And I think everyone comes to that conclusion just at different times.